Um, all right, so we have been talking about discrete variables, correct? Right? So, so discrete variables, discrete distributions, there, there's a lot of different type of, types of discrete distributions. We, have, we talked about the binomial distribution. There's one called a multinomial distribution. There's one called a geometric. There's a hypergeometric. There is one called Poisson. Um, and basically the criteria that those four pieces of criteria that we had that met a binomial distribution, to meet those other types of distributions, there's different criteria. Okay. Um, in other, so when I taught this course 10, 12 years ago without college credentialing, we talked about those things. Okay. Um, Rhodes's syllabus says that we don't talk about those things. So we're not going to, uh, at least right now, until we get through all of what Rhodes wants us to talk about. And then we'll come back if we have time and talk about maybe a geometric distribution and a um, Poisson distribution and talk about the types of probability questions that those things can target. Um, just some of them are, are useful and interesting. Today though, so, so a discrete was that the X variable could only take on whole numbers. So when we did a discrete, a discrete distribution and specifically the binomial distribution, we had, um, See here. All right, so so this distribution here, this was the um, situation where we've got um, 10. So that, that distribution right there was the, the question of if we have this multiple choice test, 10 questions on it, what are the probabilities of getting 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever uh, questions, right? Um, if we look at that, if we were to graph this, If we're to graph it, our graph is what type of graph here? Bar, bar graph, okay. Uh, we could maybe make the, the widths of these bars a little bit wider. It could be a histogram, okay. Uh, but it's some type of bar chart, right? Bar graph. What this is, because this is a discrete distribution, is 1.5 on that graph? No. Our discrete variable could not take on a value of 1.5. Because I could not answer 1.5 questions right or 1.5 questions wrong. Does that make sense? Okay. But I could answer two questions right or two questions wrong. One question right, one question wrong. But I couldn't get in the middle. What a continuous distribution allows us to do is actually have a 1.5 as a result. Okay. And that's the difference between discrete variables and continuous var variables. Continuous random variables are things like, up there you see batting uh, averages for baseball softball, that type of thing, uh, length of time of phone calls, okay? where basically what we're saying is if I'm going to talk about the length of time for a phone call, now you when, you, when you call somebody on your phone and you hang up on them, it tells you how long it took, right? But that's only precise to the nearest second, correct? Any two phone calls are probably never ever the exact same length, right? If we get down to like the nanosecond or picosecond or something like that. Does that make sense? So the term of the, the precision. So the precision of time that we use um, is going to allow us to say that no two phone calls are ever the same. However, we could then, because they're never no two phone calls are ever the same, the probability of you know having a random variable take on uh, maybe two minutes and thirty-five point. One, two, seven, six, four, three, two, one seconds uh, would be very rare for that to happen, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so we use a continuous variable, which continuous variable we look at intervals instead of exact values. Okay, um, when we talk about the length of time for a cell phone battery or um, 
heights or weights of things using scales or some type of measuring device like a um, tape measure or like I said scale. If I'm talking about measuring heights, let's say we're measuring the heights of people. Let's say that no person uh, is, you know, what's the what's the like average length of a baby? You guys know? Um, yeah, in the twenties. Okay. Uh, really? What is what is the tallest person in the world? Eight feet. Right now. Eight feet-ish. Yeah. Okay. Eight feet. right so so let's say that no matter what we do, okay. So uh, no matter who we measure, so let's say that we have like premature babies. So premature babies are like. They hold like I. So Mr. Fisher's baby was premature, like it fit in his hand. Like it's crazy. Uh, some of the pictures he showed. Like they, one thing that they put like a, like he was in like the NICU or whatever, and like one of the things they do so that their skin doesn't like stick to like fabric that they're on. They put them on Ziploc bags. His kid fit his entire body on a Ziploc bag when he was born. It's crazy. Um, he's perfectly healthy. And I think he's like six, seven months or something like that. Um, Wait, like one of the one-gallon bags or like a little sandwich bag? Yeah, a gallon bag or what? Like one of the snack bags. Oh. Okay, I don't know exactly. It's probably a gallon bag. But it's, I mean, it's still small. Um, yeah, so, so, let's, so let's say we have like a premature baby. So let's say like 15 inches. Like that's the smallest that a human could be. And let's say then 8 feet, let's say that's the largest, so 96 inches. So everybody that we measure in the world is going to somewhere come somewhere between... 15 inches and 96 inches. But if I'm 72 inches, am I 72 inches on the dot? Or if I really, if I measure with a very precise instrument, maybe a laser, am I going to be 72.0 feet or inches? No. No. I'm going to be something a little bit either smaller or bigger than that. Okay. So finding the exact value um, using discrete values, like so, we're we're basically saying that. In measuring people's height, they're not going to be 71 or 72. They can somewhere fall in between, right? They're not going to be 70, 71, 72, 73. They're going to fall in somewhere, somewhere in between. So that's what continuous random variables allow us to target, those types of situations. Question? Who conceived the child? Huh? Who conceived the child that we're talking about? Mr. Fisher. Oh, we're talking about his baby in Florida? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, no, he just had a random baby. <laughs> so... Um, standardized test scores are the same way, okay? SAT, ACT, okay? Um, and, and the idea is that when we standardize scores, we talked about this in the last class, and, and the idea of why this is important to us, when you take the ACT or you take the SAT and colleges start to look at that to decide whether they give you money or not, what they do is basically because we're looking at a population of people. So the population, uh, because we have so many uh, people that are being incorporated into this um, situation, we make the argument, and we'll talk about this later on, that it becomes uh, a normal distribution, uh, a symmetric distribution. And what we find out is that, you know, the SAT or the ACT is going to have a mean, and then it's going to have a standard deviation. So if I go out here, where I've got two standard deviations, and I go down here, and I've got minus two standard deviations, okay? This area right here, if we remember what we talked about with the empirical rule with standard deviations, that area represents 95% of the test takers. Does that make sense? So let's say the mean on the ACT, um, we could probably look this up, but let's say the mean is um, 22. I got 20 then. Okay. Uh, so if the mean is 22, let's say standard deviation is 3. So 28 or, so subtract 6 would be um, 16, right? So if that, if that was accurate data, then... Anybody that scores between 16 and 28 would be considered a usual person, right? A normal person in regards to their intellect, right? Or, or, or maybe not just their intellect, but with all the things that that test targets. Um, now, if you scored a 30, you're in the top 2.5% now. Does that make sense? 
So what do they do to those people that get 30s and 31s and 32s? Give them money. Give them money. Okay. Now what's happening is because of that number that they, you know, third, like when I was in school, like a 32, that, that got you a full ride. Okay. Now sometimes 32s don't do that. Okay. Um, because now, what, what do they have now that everybody uses when, before they take the ACT? They have ACT prep. They have classes. They have um, you know, online stuff that you can get. You have books on top of books on top of books. So you have so much things that we can use. So this mu, this mean is starting to increase. Does that make sense? And the standard deviation then is starting to tighten down. Does that make sense? Okay. And what happens then is that you're finding it less and less rare for somebody to, you know, get like a 32 on it and get a full ride. Now they're going to get some money, but are they going to get a full ride? Okay. Um, so then they start looking at other things that that person uh, does. Uh, maybe the things that they're involved in, the clubs that they're involved in, the ac or the, the athletics they're involved in, and that might then be the determining factor to give that person financial um, support over somebody else that also scored a 32. Does that kind of make sense? But these are the types of things that continuous distributions are going to allow us to deal with, okay? And continuous um, functions, uh, probability density functions are going to allow us to deal with, okay? Um, so those are just a handful of the types of uh, variables that we're going to talk about, okay? Weights, temperature, basically anything that you can measure. Uh, is going to be identified then as a continuous random variable, all right? The graph of a continuous ra uh, probability distribution is a curve, okay? So what we said earlier with the discrete, discrete was a bar graph or a histogram. For continuous, it's going to be a smooth curve, all right? Well, I'll show you some of these here in a little bit. Um, the area underneath the curve okay, uh, is going to represent probability, okay? It says area under the curve is given by a different function called the cumulative distribution function. Um, and it says the C, so we abbreviate that CDF. Uh, it is used to evaluate probability as an area, okay? Um, it says the outcomes are measured and not counted. And that's the idea. So these are all, these bullet points are all the criteria uh, that we know for continuous uh, distribution um, functions, okay? Um, it says the entire area under the curve and above the x-axis is equal to one, okay? And there's some, you see I put parentheses that there's some calculus to that. I'm gonna explain a bulk of what we talk about today is actually explaining that calculus. And I know, I know it's been a calculus, okay? Uh, but that concept, I think we can explain without the, cal the calculus uh, background, uh, and you'll understand it. But it makes, I, I think if you understand that, it makes the, prob the statistics and the probability make more sense. Um, in my personal opinion, I know you have options to take this class or calculus. I honestly think that if you took calculus before you took statistics, you'd probably be more successful at statistics. Just my opinion. I just to do that. Well, you don't have to. I just think that you're going to be... Well, I would have. Uh, probability in these types of uh, continuous variables, probability is found for intervals of X values rather than for individual X values. So when we talked about a discrete, we said, what's the probability of getting, a, getting one question right? Or what's the probability of getting two questions right? So when we talk about continuous, the idea will be, what's the probability of getting between one and three? or between one and five. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so when we talk about continuous discrete, or sorry, continuous variables versus discrete variables, continuous, you're gonna be asked questions about an interval, okay? Um, this is that interval, okay? So C and D are the endpoints of that interval, okay? Um, says the probability of C is less than X is less than D is the probability that the random variable x is inside the interval between c and d, okay? Um, c and d are gonna be, so let's say that we're measuring people and I wanna know what is the, 
What is the probability that a randomly chosen person falls between the heights of 50 inches and 70 inches? Okay, so the C and D would be the 50 and 70. Okay. Um, what we do with area, so area, and this is the calculus of this, and this is why I want to talk about the calculus of this. Area underneath a curve is found through using rectangles. Okay? So if I have an interval, like C to D, underneath my curve, then that interval is essentially the width of my rectangle. And the distribution curve, what we call the probability distribution or density function, what that provides us is essentially the top part of our rectangle. So it allows us to generate essentially a length of our rectangle. So we get a width for the C to D, and we get a height from the density function, and that allows us to find area, length times width of a rectangle, right? Does that make sense? And I'll, sh I'll show you this here in a moment graphically. Um, that being said, we can only find probabilities for an interval. We cannot find a probability for an exact value. So if I ask you what's the probability that um, this person that I choose is measured to be 62 inches tall, we can't do that in this situation, okay? Because there's not going to be a rectangular width that we can use to find area. So we'll talk, we'll discuss that here in, in a moment, okay? So it says the probability of x equals c, okay? Like we were doing with discrete values, okay? Discrete values allows the variable to take on that one value. Continuous uh, means that we're gonna be in an interval. So if we try to take on that one value, we get a probability that zero, uh, that it does not happen, okay? So the probability that x takes on any single individual value is zero, the area below the curve, above the x-axis, and between x equals c and x equals c has no width. Okay, therefore the area is zero. The last thing that we need to understand before we get into, basically what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna give you a graphic of how all this stuff should make sense to us, okay? Um, and the last thing is that whether we use less than signs or less than or equal to signs, it does not matter, the probabilities are the same, okay? Um, okay, so that being said, we know from algebra one, algebra two, some of you took college algebra, that, that is a graph of a parabola, right? Okay. Right. In calculus, what we're going to be interested in in calculus is actually trying to find out what is, let's see here, between any two values that I want to on the x-axis. So maybe I choose that value there. I'm just going to call that value C. And maybe this x value right there, I'll call that D. Calculus asks the question, if I were to take that distance, okay, and, and draw it so it intersects my curve, and then take from over here D and go straight up to where it intersects my curve, connect those C and D with that straight line, and let that be the top of this shape, calculus asks and allows us to find what that area of that shape is right there. Okay, why would I ever wanna know that, okay? So what that allows us to do, if you can visualize that little pink section, tape it to your x-axis, tape it to your x-axis, and now take your x-axis, put it in your hand, so make this like a cardboard cutout. Put it in your hand on the x-axis and spin the x-axis real fast. It's going to trace out a three-dimensional shape, right? So it kind of, uh, um, I believe it's called a frustum, um, but it shapes out basically almost like a almost like a cone with the top chopped off, right? Okay, but not a cone because the sides are going to be kind of curved. A lot of your three-dimensional shapes that uh, maybe we use in manufacturing, we actually do a lot of the prep work and understanding how to manufacture them using this type of thing, because that process, knowing that area, allows us to eventually know volumes surface areas and that sort of thing. Um, I'll show you, because somebody in the last class or first period asked that as well, uh, and I wasn't prepared for that question, but I do, because I don't and I don't know where my applet is, I gotta find my applet that will show you revolving that and getting a three-dimensional shape, okay? Um, but 
there, there's, there is a lot of reasons why we want that area. Okay, one of those reasons is so that we can talk about probability. Okay, um, now finding that area, we can use basic geometry, basic, you know, second grade, third grade math. Okay, if I want to find that area, let's just say I want to find the area between uh, negative one and positive three on this curve. Okay. So if I do that, and I'm going to use something called right now left endpoints. Okay, so basically what we do is we draw that line from negative one straight up to our curve, and we're going to bring that straight over and drop it down to three. Okay? Now, so remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to say that that area right there is, in this case, an estimation of that yellow area. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. And you might argue that it's a good estimation or bad estimation. I've got some values over here. Right now we're saying that that area is for approximately 4.8, okay, by using that one rectangle, okay? And this is called a left endpoint. Basically it means that the when I make a rectangle, that the upper left-hand corner or left, upper left-hand angle is attached to um, the curve. If I use a right endpoint, it means the upper right hand is attached to the curve. So that is an approximation for the area under the curve. This is also an approximation for the area under the curve. And you see that they're drastically different, right? And they both, to be honest with you, they both probably kind of stink as being approximations. So what we do, in calculus is that we make multiple rectangles. So there, you see that, and, and just because of the values I chose for A and B here, still gave me the same area, okay? Um, but if I use my right endpoints, you can see that that goes from that rectangle to those two rectangles, that make sense? So with this rectangle, would you guys agree that there is a lot of area up here above the curve, and that area is making up for a lot of this 11.2, which is a lot of area that is not area that we're interested in. But if I make it two rectangles, did the area that is above the curve now get minimized? Yeah, this number is still bad. It's still not a great area for under the curve, but it's better than what it was. So how do I get even better than that? I make a third rectangle, okay? Because now that number, 7.17, is better than the eight that was there previous, right? So I've, I've minimized the amount of area being overestimated, okay? Well, how do I get even better than that? Make another rectangle. And now I've got more individual rectangle or somewhat triangular shapes that are above here, but collectively, cumulatively, those areas there that are above are less area than what they were there. So I make more tri or more rectangles. Make more rectangles. And eventually, making more and more rectangles, you can see that I could go through, we've got, what, 17 rectangles here. I go find the area of each one of those rectangles. The calculus says the area of those rectangles would be length times width, right? So I could take, let's just say, let's zoom in here. Now this is not, you, you, can, you can do it differently, but all these rectangles right now are the same width, correct? So my length across that is green that I'm looking at is from negative one to three. So that's four units, correct? Okay, so let me, where'd my marker go? So, so if I take a length of four divided by 17, that would give me the width of that rectangle, right? And it's going to be the width of all those rectangles. The height of this rectangle, okay, is going to be that number three evaluated inside there. Does that make sense? So whatever that turns out to be, if we take three, so nine times 0.2, plus so this would be 2.8. Do we now know that this, so this would be, this width here is four divided by 17. 
which is 0.235. Do we now know what the area of that rectangle would be by taking 0.235 and multiplying it by 2.8? That makes sense? And we could take that area and then do the same thing with that rectangle there, and then the same thing with that rectangle there, and the same thing all the way through, and add all 17 rectangles up, right? If I add all 17 rectangles up, that's going to give me this number here, 6.06. Okay, those are called Riemann sums, okay, in calculus. Now, what would be better than 17, or 17 rectangles? 18 is better. What's better than 18? 19. So what we do, okay, and you guys, you've heard me talk about limits before, right? In, in algebra or college algebra, what we basically do, what is happening to the width of these rectangles? It's no longer 17 or start 4 divided by 17, now it's 4 divided by 40, right? Is that number, is that quotient less than it was when it was 4 divided by 17? Okay, so as the number of rectangles gets bigger and bigger, what is happening to that width of each rectangle? Smaller and smaller, okay? And right now I'm at 200, so I'd have 4 divided by 200, that is the width of each one of these rectangles. There's still rectangles here, right? And there is still, just a second, there's still, there is still overestimation occurring here if we zoom in on that curve. There's still these little chunks that are above the curve, right? So that, with 200 rectangles, is pretty good. It's a pretty good estimation, but it's still an overestimation. How many rectangles would be ideal here? Infinite. A million would be good, but that is still way too small. We want infinite. So infinite number of rectangles, what that does calculus-wise, and we would talk a lot about this prior to this discussion in calculus, but what we want is the distance between any two successive points here that di dictate the widths of these rectangles. We say we want those widths to be infinitesimally small, okay? Because if they're, if they're zero, we don't have a width to make the rectangle, right? Okay? And that's what that statement earlier was here that we can't ask that question because probability is based off the area and if we have a rectangle, this would be saying a rectangle equal to just one value, you don't have a width. You don't have an interval to allow you to find the area of that rectangle. Does that kind of make sense? Okay? So the idea is... If we want to go to infinite rectangles, okay, we call that the definite integral, which does this. And now if I zoom in on that, as far as I can zoom, is there any overlap? Are there any of those little chunks that are coming above that graph? No. Okay. And that then, you see that that is the exact area which is 5.8667, which if I use the left endpoints, you see the left and 20 rectangles, those are pretty close, right? Okay, but this is still, and in this case, this would be an underestimate of that using left endpoints. Using right endpoints, click that box. Using right endpoints, I get that number. Okay, which is an overestimate, okay? We can use midpoints. So midpoints, what that does, if we go back and look at just a couple triangles, or rectangles, I keep saying triangles, um, you see there that the midpoint of the, the rectangle is actually um, intersecting the curve there instead of the uh, angle or right angles of the rectangles. Uh, so in each one of those, you have a little bit of underestimate, a little bit of overestimate, and there's a lot more cancellation that occurs there, but you still have a result that is different. So that is using midpoints. This is using the definite integral. This is still an underestimate, but it's a much better underestimate than what that one was providing. Okay, uh, We can do it with trapezoids. Basically, any shape that we have, so that would be an estimation using a trapezoid. Okay? It's, it's better than using maybe left endpoints. Okay, uh, and we can then do that because we have a formula for trapezoids, right? 
for finding the area of trapezoid, one half uh, H uh, times B1 plus B2. And that would allow us, and we can, we can find those values through the use of knowing how many trapezoids I'm interested in. But if I look at 11 trapezoids, you see how each trapezoid has a very small amount of overestimate, right? And so 11, you know, it took us 200 rectangles to get a good estimate from um, those sums. And here it only takes us 11 trapezoids to get a pretty good estimate of that area. Okay. Huh? I want to see the most trapezoids. Okay. So. Why not just use definitive interval? Why are we going to worry about lumping points? Well, you, because, so these, these are called Riemann sums doing these, these uh, rectangles. And to be able to understand the calculus and the actual calculations, it makes sense to um, use this idea of, and trying to understand area, knowing that, that that provides me the area, but how do they, how do they get that? Okay, based off of length times width, essentially, of rectangles. Okay, so um, what we end up doing, and I'm going to put in a function here, and we'll talk about this function later on, but I've got to cut and paste it out of here real quick. If I plug that in, oh, control V, hit enter. Okay, so right now, and I don't know why this did this to me, but... There's some values down here that I want to change. We can't. Font size 14. There's one of them. Ah. Okay, so what does, what is this curve over here, what is the relationship here? What is, is it skewed, is it symmetric? It's symmetric, okay? Now if I make, if I make mu zero, where mu is the mean, and I make the standard deviation one, does anybody know what that curve is? That is the normal standard curve, okay? Normal distribution. Okay, now if I, let's go from negative one to positive one, okay, do you guys remember talking about the empirical rule and saying that 68%, 68% of our data is going to fall between one standard deviation to the left and one standard deviation to the right of the mean? We're talking about that? Okay, is that showing that right there? So the calculus is doing the area from negative one to one underneath the normal standard uh, curve. And that is where the empirical rule comes from. Does that make sense? I guess. Okay, so when we, when I ask you what is the probability uh, of some situation, um, what we're going to do is take that situation and we're going to standardize the values in that situation, which means basically if, if we have like measuring the heights of people and we say that the, the average height is 50 inches, what we're going to do is we're going to standardize that and basically say, okay, how can we make that 50 inches go to zero? And if I take everybody's height, I take 50, and the mean goes to zero, then everybody else's height, so if you're 52 inches, we're going to figure out how does, how does that 52 inches go down to something relative to zero. Does that make sense? And that's going to fit to this curve. And then I can ask the question, okay, if a, if a standard deviation is um, two inches, and I can say, how tall is someone, or what is the probability that I choose somebody that is um, between 48 inches and 52 inches? The probability of randomly selecting somebody and doing that would be 68%. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so that's what continuous variables are going to allow us to do. Okay, there's going to be a whole lot more discussion in regards to this, and that's what does run out of time right now. Um, but there's a collective group of distributions that are continuous and, and the variables that are continuous. 
We can have exponential. We can have uh, normal. Okay. Um, there, there's a lot of them, but the one that we focus on in this class that drives the rest of elementary statistics is a normal distribution. So that's the one that we're going to talk about for pretty much the rest of the year. Okay. Uh, but we could have an exponential one. We could have uh, exponential growth or decay, um, and talk about the areas under those curves as well. Okay. But we talk about the normal one for the most part. So I kind of does not every stats class are you going to talk about the calculus of, but I think when we start asking and determining, you know, why is this area representing a probability, and how does that area, how do we know that area is 0.6827, the calculus is that reason. And I think we have the ability, at least to, with that visual, to understand what's going on. Why do you make, huh? Why do you make, I don't. Why do you make things harder than they have to be? Just let me I'm know. not making, I'm, so, so, so that is trying to make what we're going to do, what you don't no is coming down the, the line in the course easier to understand. Where if you don't have this, then that stuff's going to be harder. Does that make sense? Okay. But if you see this here, obviously you're never going to experience that being harder, so maybe you don't, under, you don't know that. But it, it, the idea is talk about the calculus so that the stats down the road in the next week or so is easier to understand and it's not so abstract. Huh? I'm letting myself on the 